Hey, good day, it's Presso. Thanks for stopping by. Now, I'm working on a new project today. The Stuart Steam Engine project is still progressing, but I want to break up the release of those videos with some other projects that I'm working on. Now, this one's a doozy. Uh, one of my viewers called in about three weeks ago and he showed me some photographs of a project he was working on, and I instantly fell in love with it. And as usual, I sort of headed off on a tangent. It's on the bench over here. Now, it's a bit unusual. It involves some laser cutting, some metal finishing, some electrical components and working with stone and lots more. So let's go and take a look. Okay, so here is the project and you're probably saying to yourself, what the hell is it? <laughs> okay, a bit of background first. Now we live on a uh, road which doesn't have any street lighting. Now also we live on acreage, so our house is actually a fair way back from the street frontage and at night it's quite dark on that road and it's really hard to find properties if you're looking for a street number. So car headlights don't necessarily illuminate the edge of the road very well. Now I've always been concerned that we may need to call for an emergency services vehicle at night. We don't want them to waste time trying to find our street number. So this project is about having an illuminated street number as a sort of a permanent marker at the front of the house. Now, like I say, this project came to me via one of my viewers. Now, Steve lives in a similar situation. He's on a sort of a dark road, uh, acreage property, house set back from the road frontage. And his solution was to make a backlit illuminated sign, which was actually cut on a CNC router. So he was using some green translucent epoxy resin, and he'd routed the numbers into the back of that epoxy resin so when the light shone through, you'd see the outline of the number as a sort of a lighter color on the background. Now, I don't have a CNC router, but I have got a laser cutter. So what I've done is I've adapted the idea to suit the tools that I have. So let's talk about the hardware first. Okay, so this is the first item here. Now this is a PV cell or a solar collector cell, a solar panel, whatever you like to call it. And this one measures approximately 200 by 330 millimeters and you can purchase these quite cheaply on Amazon. I got this one on AliExpress and I will put links in the description to these parts but when you go searching for them you may not be able to find that particular cell but you'll be able to find something similar and this will supply enough current to charge the small 12 volt battery that I have. So let's have a look at that. This is the battery that I'll be using with the setup. Now this is a 12 volt gel battery. These are often used for starting small motorcycles. And I purchased this locally from an auto accessory shop. Now from memory, I think I paid about $45 for it. And it's a three amp hour battery. Now I just took a guess. I don't know if that's gonna be sufficient, uh, but these are you know, relatively cheap. You could swap them out fairly easily. So uh, it's being charged at the moment from the solar cell via this charge controller. This is the solar charge controller I'll be using. Uh, this is a model W88A. It's a 12 volt unit and it's got a rated current of 10 amps. Now I bought this on AliExpress and let's not beat around the bush. This is a cheap unit and it looks and feels quite cheap. The plastic case is very brittle and flimsy and the instructions that came with it are fairly inadequate. However, I found a website where someone had torn this down, they were somebody with a fair degree of knowledge of electronics. They had dismantled it, had a look at the parts, they'd done some performance tests, and the conclusion was that it's not bad for what you pay for it. Now, it has six terminal uh, screws at the bottom here. These two here are for the solar cell, two in the middle for the battery, two for the load. Now there's a liquid crystal display with the status uh, showing you what's happening. Now at the moment you can see that even under the lights in the garage here, the solar cell is generating a charge. And uh, in the middle you can see the state of the battery. And on the other side here, which is nothing happening at the moment, that uh, will illuminate or come on if the load is actually taking current. Now uh, that leads me to the next thing. Uh, the unit has a built-in timer. And the way it works is that the solar cell will instruct the load to turn on when the sun goes down and it will instruct the load to go off or turn off when the sun comes up. So you can set it in a dusk to dawn configuration. 
or you can set it up so that it will stay on for a fixed number of hours once the sun goes down. So there's no clock in it, it just works by knowing when the sun comes out and when it goes down. <laughs> That's basically how it works. I struggled for a while to figure that out and I went to the website and did actually explain how that worked. Now I can demonstrate uh, how the light works but we need to look at the actual lighting system first. So this is what I'm using as the light source uh, in behind each of the numbers. Now you can buy this stuff as a flexible LED neon strip. Now it's not neon at all, uh, it's just a flexible LED strip in a silicon casing there, but it's meant to emulate the old fashioned glass neon tubes. And on the back or one side of the flexible strip there, you see some black dots. Now if you cut at those black dot locations, you'll uncover the copper pads that you can solder your wires to. Now one end already comes connected when you purchase it, and if you want to use the whole string of LED, then you don't need to worry about adding any wires to it and you only need to attach the wires at one end. So to expose where those copper pads are, I just use a pair of side cutters, just cut beyond that black dot there, not right on it, and you get a little bit more copper to connect to. So you slit it through like that. And if you look inside, you'll actually see the LEDs. And <clears throat> then using a smaller pair of side cutters, I just snip off a little bit of that covering Peel that back, cut that off. And you can see the copper conductors very easily. It's got some marks on it, it tells you which is positive, which is negative, and it's fairly easy to solder to. Now, you can cut it basically anywhere. Uh, so if you want to cut off a specific length, as I had to, you don't need to cut on another black dot. You can cut anywhere you like. Uh, if you're sort of unlucky, lucky, you might cut right through one of the LEDs. What I tend to do is cut it longer than I need and just gradually snip it back, looking inside as you go, and you'll be able to get through the, the actual flexible uh, conductors inside there without damaging anything else. But in practice, I found that I could cut it to a specific length and it still works. So uh, that's, that's what we're using for our light source. So I just want to demonstrate how the timer function works on this charge controller. So I'll start the stopwatch here after I cover up the solar cell. And it takes about 30 seconds, I'm guessing, uh, for the charge controller to recognise there's no power coming from the solar cell. And then there's some internal wizardry that goes on there and it will turn on the LED. So we'll just wait. Yep, so it's about 30 seconds and the same thing happens when you take the cover off the solar cell which is equivalent to it seeing the daylight. And again, uh, we'll just do that again. It takes about 30 seconds. So there it is. And remember there's no clock in this so it makes setting it really, really easy. I think I'm just going to run this on a dusk to dawn type arrangement. Now when I began this project I had to be very careful about material choices. So I wanted to be sure that the materials I use are going to be moisture resistant and UV resistant because you don't want to be replacing these parts you know, every two years or so because they become damaged due to UV exposure and moisture and so on. So this is actually a three layer lamination. Now the top layer is three millimeter thick aluminium and it's going to be powder coated. The powder coat color I'll be using is this one here. It's called Empire Copper Vein. And this is more about getting good contrast for daylight viewing. But the powder coat also protects the aluminium from oxidizing. Now the two layers in the back of that are eight millimeter thick acrylic. Now I chose that because I happen to have some on hand. I didn't have to buy it. But also 8mm is about the limit that my laser cutter engraver can work with. Anything thicker than that you'd have to do 3 or 4 passes to get through it. So I'll show you in a minute how I did the laser cutting. And all of the hardware that I've used here is steel but later on I will be using stainless steel to hold it all together and also to hold it to the backing that will go on the gate post. So let's have a closer look now at how we did the laser cutting. To create the DXF files I needed for the laser cutter, I just used Corel Draw. I typed in the numbers that I needed in the font or typeface that I liked. 
and after that you convert the typeface to a vector object. Once I was happy with the position and size of each of the numbers, I drew a Bezier curve down the center line of each of the number objects. Now this will track the position of the LED strip that we're going to insert at a later stage and it takes a bit of time to get the alignment and the bending of that Bezier curve the way you want it. And we're just looking for a nice gentle curve where it bends around the corners. Once we got that, we can assign a thickness to the Bezier curve. So in this case, I was using six millimeters, which is the width of the LED strip. When you're happy with all of that, we convert that vector line into an object. And once we have that, we can remove the fill from that object and we're just left with the outline. Now with all of that settled, you export the entire image as a DXF file and that's what we're going to send to the laser cutter engraver. So here is one of the clear acrylic profiles and I use a 50 watt CO2 laser to do this. Now if you've got a 120 watt CO2 laser, you would be able to cut this at one pass. Now I had to use two passes at 5 millimeters per second and about 90% power. I did some tests first on some scrap to determine what those settings would be. And on the second pass, you can tell if you cut right through the acrylic by looking at where the laser beam exits the back of the clear acrylic. Now, depending on what sort of table you have in your CO2 laser, you will see some yellow or white sparkles as the laser beam traces across the top of that table. Now, if you don't see that, there's a chance that you haven't cut right through and you might need to do a second pass. But uh, in my case, I've got a sort of a, uh, like a perforated steel mesh in the table of my laser, and you can see those sparkles quite clearly. Now, after taking the parts out of the laser, they won't have a very polished edge on them. They'll be sort of uh, a bit ragged and a bit striated, and you need to go over to the bench with a file and draw file all of the edges until you get a square cut profile on the edge. And from there, it's all about using uh, different grades of sandpaper, sanding it smooth until you can finally go to the buffing machine to get a polish on it. So I started with ordinary 100 grit woodworking paper, sanded that until all of the file marks were gone. From there I switched over to 180 grit paper, same style of woodworking paper, and we sand again until we've got a smooth finish. And after that it was a case of just using 400 grit wet and dry paper. Now I did it dry, but it works better if you do it wet. And from there, we go over to the buffing machine and we put the final polish on the material. And uh, like I said, you need to have two of those panels. So the LED strip will poke up inside that profile there and it leaves about three or four millimeters on both sides. Now what I'll do after the assembly is I'm going to use silicon, clear silicon, to seal up both ends and I haven't quite decided yet whether I'll actually pack silicon in the entire length of that LED track there. I guess that would be the most durable way of doing it, but it's also going to get very messy as well. And I'll bond the aluminium top cover to that also with silicon, just to make sure we don't get any moisture going in between the different layers there. And to make the aluminium profiles, the top of that number stack, I traced out the shape of the acrylic parts that I'd already laser cut onto some 3mm thick aluminium and I cut the profile on my small metal cutting bandsaw. After that it was just a case of refining the shape using files and the belt grinder.
I think this Empire Copper Vein powder coat that I'm using has real copper in it. It sort of shows up on the gloves. It's a shiny metallic finish and the powder itself is quite heavy and uh, maybe that's a good thing if you're putting this outside. I've just loaded up those parts with the oven cold. Uh, it's a lot safer to do it that way. There is a wire frame in the top of the oven that you can't see and you've got to hook those little hanging wires over that wire frame and of course there's an element above and there's one at the back so if you're fumbling around trying to find that little wire frame you can touch the element and burn your hand and then you panic and you drop the part <laughs> yeah, it's a mess so um, I'll just close the door up now and then we'll set the oven going and then uh, yeah let them cook Just let these cool down in the oven. I'll hang them up now to cool off completely. And you can see that really nice texture. That material's had a chance to cool down completely now. I'm really happy with the way that powder coat has turned out. I love the colour and it's a really good contrast against this piece of sandstone that I bought at the local garden centre. So this was about $35. It was actually bigger than this and I've cut it down to 400 millimetres square. And I've marked out the holes that will be used to bolt that piece of sandstone to the front gate post. Now, I, those hole positions were fixed. I couldn't change that. And uh, it's, this one down here is going to be a bit of a nuisance. It's going to be really close to the bottom of that number seven. But I think I can position things to make that work. Now, the, the good thing about using this textured powder coat is that any defects in the original material are partially hidden. So there was a big dent there. I didn't realize it when I marked out that number. Uh, and as luck would have it, it's right in the middle. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, in this application, I'll get away with it. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to drill holes in the sandstone for all of the fixing positions for the, the numbers. So there are seven holes all together. And I'm using stainless steel socket head cap screws now to hold everything. And in the back, I will have a small acrylic washer and also a brass thread insert. Now the idea of the acrylic washer is to stand the numbers up off the surface so that any moisture that runs down the back will drain out and dry completely. And I'm going to bond those brass thread inserts into the sandstone with epoxy. All right, lots of, uh, lots of drilling to go now. <laughs> Let's hope I don't crack the sandstone. This is one of the holes that will be used to bolt this piece of sandstone to the front gate post and it's about the right diameter for these brass thread inserts. So what I'll do is I'll drill all of the holes to bolt the numbers on. I'll fill the holes with clear epoxy and then we'll just stand those thread inserts up in the hole until the epoxy sets. So it doesn't need to be a super strong connection, it's just simply to hold the numbers in place, you know, load on them and then we can go ahead and get it all assembled. Okay, uh, I've struggled with this for about half an hour and I'm sort of constrained by the position of this bolt hole here, which I can't change. And I'd love to be able to bring this seven over further to the left, but I can't. And there is a rule called kerning. Now kerning relates to the character spacing between one character and the next. Now there are you know, rules, they're not strict rules, you can't break them, but there are rules governing where you place each character on that line. Now, uh, this zero is probably too far over to the right and the seven is probably not far enough to the left. And uh, I, all I can do here is place the, the one sort of in the middle. And I like that uh, layout there. Others will disagree. Um, if you disagree, put your uh, reasoning in the comments. Uh, I've got broad shoulders, I can take that on board. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> These are the stainless steel security screws that I'll be using to hold this piece of sandstone to the front gate. But these are countersunk, so I need to put a corresponding countersink in each of the mounting holes. And I purchased one of these uh, like Kango stone and porcelain drill bits, but I'm just using this as a countersink.
So yeah, expensive purchase, but it does work. <laughs> so I've had a go at fitting these threaded brass inserts into the pre-drilled holes. Now these are going to hold the numbers onto the sandstone. Took two goes, but I've got a process that works now, so I'll talk you through that. So this is how I'm going to do it. I've got a hex nut on the top of this assembly. I've got the clear acrylic spacer underneath that and the brass insert all right on the bottom. And I'm just going to fill the hole with epoxy and then drop that in there. But we do not want to glue the screw into the hole. You've got to be able to withdraw the screw later. So I've worked out a way of putting a wax release agent on the screw and it comes out quite easily when we're done. So I've got a small butane torch here and I've taken the brass threaded insert off the screw then. I've left the hex nut on. I'm just going to heat that up a little bit. And I've got an old candle and we're just going to run some of that melted candle wax up over the thread and on the end of the screw. And then you can put the spacer back on and the threaded insert. So while the wax is still slightly liquid, you can get that on there. And there will be enough wax on the end of that screw thread now that we can withdraw it from the epoxy later without it sticking. I'm using the Super Strength 24 hour arrow light for this. And somebody put me onto this idea of using the blue painter's tape to mix your epoxy. Uh, great idea. Except this blue tape is expensive. <laughs> That's about all you need. Just poke the threaded insert into that. That's it. And I'll just leave that set overnight. So that epoxy is cured now overnight and I can show you that the screws come out quite easily so the wax has done its job there. And the little acrylic disc is now glued to the stone but that's okay we want them to stay there. Well, they're all in now. Uh, these through holes here, there's three of them, they are to take the wires from the LED strip they go right through to the back and they're going to travel through conduit and then they'll meet up at a junction box, a waterproof junction box. That'll keep the battery and the charge controller dry and secure. And uh, next thing we need to do is get these siliconed into the number assemblies. Okay, I've just assembled the first of these digits and I'm using this clear silicon and I'm using that as sort of a bonding agent and also as a waterproofing. So I did the two pieces of clear acrylic first and I've just held together with some of these spring clamps and I've just added on the aluminium top cover and I'm using the bolts to hold that together. And uh, I hate using the silicon, it's awful stuff. It gets everywhere, it gets on your fingers, um, you can't see it. Uh, and I'm having to clean up as I go with this mineral turpentine. But you still feel it with this greasy coating. Now the, the final stage here is to put a thick bead of silicon all the way down that cutout track there and I have to be particularly careful about the wire entry point at this end and the other end of the LED strip at this end here because we don't want to get any moisture inside that silicon cover on the LEDs. Now I'm hoping that if these ever fail, if the LEDs fail, I can still get that, that strip out of there. I'll just have to sort of cut it and dig it out but I certainly don't want to get moisture in that anywhere. So I'll go ahead and do the others and then we'll put it together. Hey, that's a story about Wilbos. That's the charity that I support with the income from this channel. Yeah, big story in the local paper. Just seal the back of that number one digit there with the silicon. So I put blue painter's tape over the back of the digit and I cut out the track with a scalpel. And then I just squeezed the silicon down inside the groove there I went around the wire entry point with my finger just to make sure it was well and truly sealed and then I used one of these silicon scrapers to go around and remove the excess. So I can take the tape off later on and I won't leave a mess. So I'll do the others off camera. Just before I do the big reveal I thought I'd show you a couple of the last minute details I had to attend to. So the three sets of wires for the three sets of LEDs come through these drilled holes here and I've gouged out a groove in the back of the sandstone and hot glued the pairs of wires into that groove there. 
and they've all been terminated onto this red and black wire here with some of those heat shrink uh, hot glue solder type connectors and this wire here will go through the fence itself and out the other side and that will be attached to the junction box on the back side of the fence. So on the front side here I just washed the sandstone and scrubbed it that's why it looks a bit dark and I powder coated the heads of the screws so they now are the same colour as the aluminium numbers. So I'll light it up, show you what it looks like in the daytime, but uh, I bet you want to see what it looks like at night, but you're going to have to wait, it's only 10 to 3. Well there it is, and I know it's not that impressive during the daytime, but I can see that subtle green glow around each of the numbers. And overall I'm quite happy with the way this has turned out, but this is probably me just being pedantic. But I can see an issue on the edge of this number zero, so let's have a closer look. Well, you can see here what I'm talking about. That bright patch that you can see around that joint is air that's sucked into the two halves of that acrylic piece. And uh, the silicon that I use there hasn't really penetrated all the way to the outside edge there, or when I remove the clamps, it's relaxed a bit and sucked air back into that joint. Now, it's not going to delaminate, it's not going to affect the way the number works, but it does mean that moisture can get in there at a later stage and that could lead to dust and dirt, uh, you know, discolouring that joint there. So uh, it's not really, a, you know, like a functional issue, it's more of an aesthetic issue. And just this morning I thought of a better way of doing this. You know, I know, just after I'd finished the whole project, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. So I'll show you what I have in mind. Okay, so this is just a mock-up. Now, this is 3D printed and it's not the correct size, but it'll give you an idea of what I have in mind. So this is going to be cast in solid aluminium, it will be powder coated as well. And there's no acrylic on the edge, there's nothing to be sealed or joined, it's just a one piece aluminium casting. Now the LED strip is going to be flipped so that the green cover is actually facing the surface of the stone and it will throw the light directly back against that surface. And because of the relative heights of the two parts of the casting, the LED strip is going to be closest to the stone but there will be a gap all the way around the outside there. So this outer edge of the number is about half the height of the LED strip. So that allows the light to actually leak out through the side there. Now the only sealing that will be required is at either end of the LED strip and that's fairly straightforward. And uh, I think this is going to be a way, way more durable solution and it works just as well as this. So I'll light this one up here and I'll show you what I mean. Now, unfortunately I didn't make these wires long enough to show you clearly how this is going to work but you get the idea. So this is just as legible as the other one that I made but being a one piece construction it's going to be way way more durable. It does mean some interesting pattern making challenges though you need to have draft on the outside and the inside of all of the parts of the casting and uh, machining that little track in there means just leaving just enough material to get the six millimeter wide mill track in there. Now it does mean making patterns and making moulds and making castings, but I enjoy that sort of thing anyway. So you may get to see this as a future project, but for now, I need to get this lit up in the dark. Now it's not completely dark, but I've got to have a little bit of light to work with while I do this. And there is a storm at the moment, uh, which is all of the noise you can hear on the roof. But we're going to push on regardless. So I'll connect up the battery. And there it is. Now I'm totally happy with this. I think it looks beautiful. And I love the fact that you can see all of the texture in the sandstone. So this was not a sawn piece of stone, it's actually a naturally split piece. And with the light being so close to the surface of the stone, it does show up all of those lovely textures and contours. So I'm very happy with that. Now, can it be improved? Absolutely. Uh, and you may see that at some point in the future. But for now, I think this is perfectly legible. If you stand back about 10 meters, it's very, very clear. The light is not really obtrusive, but it's enough to be able to make out those numbers from the roadside. So I'm totally happy with that. Okay, let's turn the lights on and we'll finish up this segment. Well, that's it guys. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the build. Now, just so you know, I have decided to go ahead and work on the cast metal numbers for this sign. Now, I've already worked out the patterns, but I will do that as a separate standalone metal casting video at a later stage. Now I imagine you also want to see this in place out the front of our property with the solar panel and the charger and everything working. Uh, the main reason I'm not doing that is it's rained here for about the last week and it's absolutely horrible out the front of our place at the moment. It's just wet and boggy and terrible. 
so it's not the right time to do it. But I'm confident it's going to work. And in the next video that you see from me, we'll be working on the Stuart steam engine again. I've got about three more videos lined up uh, for the completion of that project, but that will also be an ongoing project. I'm going to sort of add some other stuff to that at a later point. So tune in for that. should be a heap of fun. But for now, it's Prezzo signing out, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.